Checking in with the State Senator John Keenan of Quincy from the Norfolk Plymouth District for an update on what's happening uh, legislatively and here in the district. Hey, John, good to see you again. How are you? Great to see you. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, unfortunately, still virtual, uh, but thankfully we have this option to talk at least. Yes, it's, 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 it's a great opportunity, so I thank you for it. Thank you. And the legislature, as I understand, too, is still virtual, correct? It is. Um, we have been in and out of the building periodically. A lot, I think it was about a week or two ago that I covered a session, but the sessions are mostly being done virtually when they're formal sessions and informal, informally they're just being done in the normal, the normal course as well. Yeah. Any indication from the Senate President as to when some in-person meetings might be held? No, as I say, there are occasionally there are members that will be in there distancing, very strict about that. Uh, as to when the State House will be open to even employees and to the public, it's really unknown now. I would have thought it would be sooner rather than later, but the numbers of cases are spiking again. And so um, we have quickly embraced the technology and are doing things virtually. So um, I assume we're going to continue on that path for the, for the immediate future anyway. Yeah. Speaking of spiking numbers, how do you feel about, um, you know, the latest uh, phase two um, uh, opening and uh, some of the easing of those restrictions? It's, um, I, I, have, I have faith that Massachusetts has done things pretty wisely. And that's because we've got some of the best and brightest minds here in the medical community and the scientific community and, and government is, is listening to them. But we're seeing the same uh, uptick in cases as other states are. And uh, in Europe, you know, they're, they're really concerned about what's next. I know in my district, three towns overnight went into the red zones, which means they're at, at risk and they may have to change a lot of what happens in the town uh, should that continue for three weeks. So Abington, Rockland and Holbrook have all been elevated in terms of um, their, the number of cases and the, and the risk level. So it is concerning and particularly so with the flu pan, you know, with the flu coming. And so the uh, seasonal flu in combination with the pandemic, we've got to make sure that our hospitals are ready to handle the, uh, both of those at once. And we do have some hospitals in Massachusetts that are already in the surge situations, meaning they've changed their normal operations to accommodate the demand for inpatient care from uh, beginnings of the seasonal flu and uh, for those that uh, are suffering with COVID-19. Do you know the uh, field hospitals that were set up over the summertime, are those still a viable option if needed? Yeah, I, I, one thing that the, the Commonwealth has done is we've, we've learned a lot from what we went through back in the spring. So the ability to put those field hospitals back in place quickly is there. I think the hope is that we won't have to get to that, that if people wear the mask, safely distance and avoid crowds, that we will be able to to handle both the seasonal flu and COVID-19 cases. But um, the, the trend is, is concerning. I wouldn't say it's alarming right now, but it's concerning. And when that does happen and the state comes out and says, oh, you've been elevated, it, uh, generally you then see a bit of a drop afterwards because people do get concerned and they, while they may have been complacent, it reinforces, okay, we're not out of this. I've got to go back to being more careful. Yeah. Do you think a statewide mask mandate is in order at this point? I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I think the purpose of, of tracking the communities and giving notice as to when communities are facing rising levels is designed to encourage people to go back to wearing masks. And uh, so as long as they keep doing that and as long as the compliance is there, which I think it is, then um, that I think works better than a mandate. Right now, the mandate is so politically charged that um, if there were to be a mandate it would really, really have to be absolutely required because the pushback to, to that um, would actually, I think, result in, in steps backwards in terms of us uh, handling the pandemic. Yeah. In terms of um, the public schools, uh, John, how do you think that they've been handling the situation in, in your district specifically? So far, so good. Um, they're, all, they're adapting. They're adapting well. I've been in touch with the superintendents uh, and, and mayors and school committee members. Um, they're just concerned. They're worried that as much as they believe there is a good quality of education being provided and that students are engaged, it's not the same. They're anxious to get back in the classroom, but they are really concerned about their ability to do that safely. And so there's that balanced approach uh, of, of hybrid and, um, you know, in different communities are doing it differently, but so far so good. And we're hopeful that uh, progress will continue to be made and that ultimately uh, students will get back into classroom in some form, whether it's it's full time or on a rotational basis. Yeah, we talked a little bit about um, 
The economic impacts, uh, we just saw earlier this week, uh, the governor put forth a budget proposal and uh, starting to look at tapping into the rainy day fund too. Yes, so um, they're talking about about $1.35 billion draw from the rainy day fund. Well, there's a couple things at play. We have a lot of capital projects that are out there and one of the ways that you kind of come out of uh, a, a situation like this, an economic situation like, like this, is to continue to invest in your capital projects. And in, to do that, it's very important that we take advantage of our bond rating and current interest rates. And the bond rating agencies are sending the message that a draw from your any day account is responsible. However, you have to match that with responsible spending, otherwise you may have a negative impact on your bond rating, and that then costs more to borrow and to borrow, when it costs more to borrow, you're less inclined to do some of the projects that are needed and that also serve to bring us out of this. So uh, it's a responsible proposal of $1.35 billion. Um, it's matched with some federal funds that, uh, that, that are in place now that can be used to help us with the current year um, budget. And, and also it reflects a commitment to essentially level fund many of our budget line items. Some will see a little bit of a drop, some will see an increase. Uh, for instance, in mass health, there's gonna be some increased uh, spending. We wanna make sure that there's appropriate spend spending in our behavioral health lines because people are really struggling. Um, we know that we're gonna to have to address housing um, through some additional funding, with some additional funding. So all of that together, um, this is the governor's proposal. The House and Senate will proceed with theirs uh, I met with um, the chair of the Senate Ways and Means yesterday, expressed what my concerns were. We talked about the general budget process. Um, we're optimistic that we will get through this with uh, too much damage done to our uh, those that rely on the state budget. But there is some concern about the following fiscal year, FY22, which normally would be in the planning stages for that right now. But we're still working on getting an FY21 budget in place five months into the fiscal year. Right. Any indication right now as to uh, what the revenue loss will be for, for 2021? There's, there's a pretty wide range of that. There was a, uh, a consensus revenue hearing, I think it was last week. And so we, the um, Ways and Means Committees and, and most of the Senate and the House were involved in the meeting as well. We had people from Mass Taxpayers Foundation, uh, Beacon Hill Institute, our Department of Revenue, Federal Reserve Bank. And there's a pretty wide range as to what that projected revenue loss will be over what was anticipated. Um, people seem to be getting comfortable with the number of about three and a half billion dollars, which is pre pretty, pretty substantial. But again, draw from the rainy day account, some federal money, uh, tight budgeting, we hope we'll get through it. But um, some, you know, the middle estimate seems to be about three and a half billion dollars. Okay, and the, the total state budget is, is, is about how much? Well, $43 billion. Uh, the governor's most recent proposal, I think, is $45.5 billion, which is interesting because it's more than what he submitted back in January. Hmm. But it does reflect um, the need to, to meet some of the demands associated with the pandemic, and it does reflect the ability to use some federal funds. And so um, we're hopeful that that will, with the Senate and House and ultimately the governor come to agreement on, we'll meet all the demands. And those demands are growing and they're, they're very worrisome. What are um, some of the capital projects in your district that, that might be funded through this budget? Um, well, not necessarily through this budget, through the, but through the, the capital plan. One of the ones that we have uh, on the books uh, that's going through the early planning stages is a new Norfolk County Superior Courthouse. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, when I was chair of the um, Senate Bonding Committee, we worked on that. Um, that project is now number one on the, the capital plan. And uh, there's been some communication with the city to, to go through the early stages of kind of doing what they call the programming. How many square feet do we need? How many courtrooms do we need? What do we need for lockup? So that's one of the, the, the big ones. Obviously, uh, our school funding, uh, our capital projects, most of that funding comes through the, um, the Mass School Building Authority. Uh, but we're looking at some projects in, in Quincy for schools, Braintree for schools. Uh, Rockland is looking at another school, an elementary school. We've been involved with some land transfers to accommodate them for a new um, new school. And then the MBTA, obviously there's a lot of capital spending relative to the MBTA. So a whole lot of different things out there. Um, and um, Seawalls is another one that we've worked hard to get some state funding uh, to match some federal and to match some city funding. And so all of those are capital projects which are needed and good for the economy. 
Yeah, the T, I, I, under, I was under the impression the T has its own separate budget, is, but is that also part of the total state budget? They do have a separate budget, and we fund a significant portion of their budget mm-hmm. um, with state revenues. And they are obviously experiencing financial difficulties. They are struggling to get through the current fiscal year. They're projecting a pretty significant operating deficit of about $400 million starting in FY22. So to address that, they're looking at all kinds of options. And one of the options, obviously, is level of service. So they are looking at level of service on all their bu- on their bus lines, uh, ferries, red line, um, other subway lines, and also commuter rail. So we may see, for instance, in Quincy, uh, a reduction in how frequently the train co- trains arrive. Right now, the headway, they call it, you know, they want to get it down to four minutes, but it's somewhere about six. Uh, because of demand, uh, it could end budget issues, it could be a 10 minute headway. Mm. Means uh, the trains could be a little bit more crowded than what they are now, but we'll have to see. And also we're experiencing some delays in getting the new red line cars uh, on, in service, as well as the orange line cars. Um, there have been some issues associated with the plant out in Springfield, getting materials um, for those uh, projects and getting those up. Um, generally they've been pushed back about a year so that affects level of service as well. So the MBTA, uh, because of revenue, uh, revenue loss, is really in a tough situation right now. Yeah. Do you think that they should maybe look at um, cutting some capital projects first, you know, rather than cutting service? Yeah. It, well, it's, um, they, they're separately budget, budgeted, even though, you know, within the regular budget, obviously, there is a line item to pay for um, the expense of their capital projects and the, the bonds that are out there. But you know, most economists would say you look at the interest rates right now, they are so favorable. Um, the ability to do work because service requirements and service demands are down, mm-hmm. um, the combination of low borrowing, uh, available money, and less impact on commuters makes this a very good time to be doing some of the capital projects. Now, we're not going to be able to um, you know, do some of the things, for instance, as quickly as we'd love like with rail out to Springfield and to Western Massachusetts. Right. Um, the South Coast Rail Project is proceeding, but uh, that um, I anticipate will be somewhat delayed. So the focus is on what can we do uh, with the low interest rates, the available capital, do it quickly, and bring our state of good repair um, to the level where you know, the T is operating as best as it can, and then we look at the bigger projects. Yeah, I know the argument always is, you know, these projects also employ people uh, and that in turn, you know, helps the economy. So it really is a fine line, a fine balancing act that, that they're yeah. walking here. Yes. No, we no. Talk a little, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 that, I was just saying I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, speaking of uh, people working and, and having trouble meeting demands, can we talk a little bit about um, the eviction moratorium uh, that's set to expire actually on Saturday, I think it is, uh, or sometime this this weekend and the proposal to extend that. So the eviction moratorium is set to expire October 17th. Okay. And that has been in place for several months now and the governor has chosen not to extend it. That's at the state level. At the federal level, there is a moratorium that's in place put there by the CDC. That goes through the end of the calendar year. It's not as comprehensive of a um, moratorium as the, the state uh, plan that's that's in place until the 17th. So the governor is faced with the issue and the legislature may, may address this on its own, but what to do after the 17th. The governor's response has been to dedicate, I think about $161 million uh, to its programming that will help tenants and landlords. That um, if a tenant is in arrears, they will be able to apply for these funds and then with proper documentation from the tenant and the landlord, have that funding go directly to the landlord. And there has been a cap to date of about $4,000 per tenant and landlord on those funds. This has gone on much longer than anybody expected. So one of the proposals is to increase that cap so that the landlord uh, on behalf of the tenant could receive up to $10,000 payment for amount in arrears, plus a monthly payment until they reach $10,000. And in exchange for that, the landlord does not proceed with any sort of eviction. And if somebody's $8,000 in arrears um, and the landlord only gets two months worth of rent to reach the 10,000 and the landlord accepts that, the landlord agrees not to evict uh, over the course of the next 
um, six months or until June if there are children involved. That's kind of the rough plan now that's subject to change, but that's been the response to ending the moratorium. There is legislation that would extend the moratorium and landlords are very concerned about that because they have utility obligations, property tax obligations and mortgage obligations. And if there's no forbearance on mortgages, they fear that they will face eviction um, and or rather foreclosure on their on their properties. Right. So uh, I don't know whether the legislature will take any action. There's been some discussion informally about it. My contribution has been to find the right balance to keep tenants in their units and to keep homeowners in their homes and to keep landlords, you know, in a position where they can keep the properties and keep the tenants in it. Um, I've suggested that as we go forward, one of the things that may be helpful to landlords is for those eviction cases that had started before the pandemic and the state of emergency, that those be allowed through the courtroom doors, so to speak, into the mediation process. That will give the landlord some relief. It will even help some of the tenants kind of get some certainty as to where they are. And my guess is that the courts, which are now hiring retired judges to, to handle this mm. um, expected number of cases, uh, will be a little bit more forgiving in the process given the pandemic. And so maybe we can find that middle ground of, of protecting tenancies and helping uh, landlords keep their properties as well. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. complicated. It is complicated. If the landlord um, does not want to kind of opt into that program, I mean, uh, can they, you know, stay out of it and proceed with the evictions? They can proceed, but then the tenant would have the option of, of uh, trying to participate. The landlord has not had the option to this point. It's always been up to the tenant. And some landlords are saying, I know there are tenants out there that are struggling, that have lost full employment or partial employment that can't pay, but they're just kind of letting the situation stay, stay idle. They're not trying to address it. And they're, so they're trying to encourage those tenants to, to avail themselves of these programs. Mm -hmm. but the idea would be to allow a landlord to initiate that process okay. where a tenant may be hesitant and, and then get them together and try to work it out. You know, we, we just got today the latest unemployment figures, which gives some indication of how real this may be. And in Massachusetts, new claims are at about 40,000 this week, which are up uh, over 10,000 from the prior week. Wow. So the number of unemployed isn't going down. Um, new claims are up. They're up significantly in that mirrors what's happened nationally. Nationally, I think there's about 900,000 uh, new claims for unemployment in the past week. So it is still a very difficult situation. And with that many people unemployed, it certainly impacts evictions and foreclosures when it comes to housing. Yeah. Is that fund, is that solvent, the unemployment fund? No, the unemployment fund is, is facing some real challenges. Um, and in business owners, it's one of those unexpected or not unexpected, but one of those costs that most people don't think of that, that business owners have to pay on behalf of the employees. And we have, over the last few years, essentially frozen the rate of contribution by business owners. And the goal is to do that again, but it's one of those costs that is quite significant. We extended unemployment benefits to people who participate in the economy, gig workers, contract workers, who, because they're independent contractors, don't pay unemployment insurance, but many of them lost their contracts, lost their jobs. So unemployment benefits were extended to them. And so we have to figure out a way to, to balance that, to replenish the unemployment compensation trust fund and um, without further hurting businesses because businesses, uh, particularly those in the service economy are really struggling right now. Yeah, I know, especially uh, with the winter months coming, a lot of restaurants are very concerned. Some have decided to close or just not open. Um, I think I've heard figure something like 20% statewide, uh, you know, what will not reopen after this. Right. Yeah. That's the estimation. I think 20 to 25% of restaurants may not open. And, and that's a lot of employees. Yeah. What would you be willing to look at in terms of state budget cuts, John, if it ever came to that, you know, how do you prioritize that? It, it's so difficult. I, I guess, you know, my, what we have committed to so far, and I think this is probably first and foremost, is that we have committed to local aid at level funding to last year. Okay. It's a cut over what they were anticipating for the current fiscal year, but as level funded, and in some cases, has been an inflationary adjustment for the community, um, but essentially level funded for a state aid to municipalities. And a big chunk of that is Chapter 70, which is school funding. And we had hoped 
to fund this year, and the governor had committed to it, and the House and Senate were on their way to funding it, the Student Opportunity Act, which was landmark legislation that would have um, allocated more resources to communities that had a greater need for them in terms of education. We, uh, all we've been able to do is commit to level funding. So, uh, and that's a pretty sizable commitment when it comes to chapter 70, which is our school funding. We've also committed to level funding for our unrestricted general government aid. The combination of those funds uh, fund our schools, police, fire, veterans, senior citizens, libraries. So we've, we've looked to level fund those. That's been our first priority. For me, the second priority, and this is um, beyond the district concerns that I have, is to make sure that our behavioral health needs are being met. Our medical health needs generally through mass health and, and uh, federal funding, those generally work out okay. Um, behavioral health, mental health and substance use often gets lost in that mix. And we are seeing a, a significant demand or need, I guess I'll say need right now for those services. The demand is different than the need, which is interesting. Uh, which is interesting. We've talked to our providers and they are saying that they do have available beds, both mental health and substance use, but there's a real hesitancy uh, out in the communities for people to go and get treatment because of fear of contracting the virus and being in a closed place. So we have a lot of people struggling at home with mental health and substance use issues and struggling on the streets with mental health and substance use issues. Um, it was interesting, I was down in a neighborhood of Boston about a couple months ago. I like to go out and walk through neighborhoods and talk with people. And this is the Melnia Cass Mass Ave area, which some people refer to as Methanol Mile. So I spent two or three hours down there just talking to people and uh, it's a really, really dire situation. People who would ordinarily be on their way to treatment just aren't going there. Um, and then you did have some of them who have housing who receive some additional funds from the federal government, and that was an incentive for them as well not to go in and get the treatment that they need. So there's a need, but the demand isn't quite where the need is, and the providers are fearful that they'll see budget cuts, and when that demand increases, they're not gonna be able to meet it. And that's inevitable. That's going to happen in the next couple of months uh, as we get into the winter months. So um, we've got to make sure that we have proper funding in place for that. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's been called, I guess, the, the hidden pandemic uh, as a result of all this is folks, you know, struggling quietly and not reaching out uh, for assistance. Um, it's, it's financially, it's, it's going to take a toll in years to come, I'm sure. Yes. And we see it. Um, you know, the other thing that we uh, are focused on the, on the budget is, is housing, as we talked about yeah. just a short while ago. And then uh, ways to generate you know, jobs within the economy and for those that don't have jobs to make sure that we have resources for, out there uh, relative to food, food security. We talked with Beth Ann Stroll from QCAP about making um, make sure we have funding in place for childcare needs so people can go to work who are working, that we have uh, funding in place for those who are unemployed or underemployed now so that they can uh, provide heat in their homes. And we expect with if you were full-time working and now you're half-time, but you're doing it remotely, you're gonna be in your home more hours a day. And there'll be a greater demand, we think, for heating oil, um, heating assistance, whether it's oil or gas, or whatever the case may be. So all of those are out there and it's, it's, it's quite, a, quite a juggling act, quite a puzzle that we have to solve. Yeah, it's, I mean, as you're well aware right here at, um, in Quincy, uh, Father Bills is looking to relocate to a new facility. I spoke with John Yeswinski and they're hoping to launch uh, a campaign to raise about $20 million. Um, is there help at the state level for them? Yes, we provide state assistance uh, to Father Bills. Um, they are a great organization. The work what they do that they do with the money that we give them, um, and it's never enough money that the state can give because the demand is so great. Um, they really do some phenomenal work. And we've been in regular contact uh, with, with John um, as they are planning their new location and then juggling uh, the, uh, coordinating the timing of all that with the city and the city's uh, development of a uh, construction of a public safety building. And so um, we work to get the resources, as many resources as we can to, to Father Bill's uh, mainspring. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, they're seeing the need too. And yeah, it's just need everywhere out there. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm forever the optimist. Well, I know you have encouraged folks who, uh, who are doing well during this time, and there are folks who are doing okay, to consider folks that aren't, basically. 
Yeah, there's been a lot of talk, for instance, about whether we would have to do anything relative to taxes at the state mm-hmm. level. We don't think we're going to have to okay. in, in the immediate future. We'll see how the economy rebounds and how all that goes. But as we look at the need for additional revenue at the state level, you know, I think we should look and find out who's done really well in this economy. And there are some people who have done very well in this economy where other than some social isolation issues, they haven't seen any financial harm. In fact, some people have done, as I say, economically very well. If, if we can find a way to, to get to them and if need be uh, to tax, you know, um, th- th- those folks and uh, find a way to do that so that uh, the pre- people that are working up, uh, waking up, trying to keep food on the table, a roof over their heads while working uh, one or two or three part-time jobs, uh, maybe have lost one of those. There's not much revenue to be gained from that and that would have a significant impact on the economy. But there are some ways to relative to capital gains, offshore business taxes, uh, things of that nature that we could be rather surgical on. And uh, those who have done the best and who have done well would be asked in that manner to, to contribute more. Whatever happened to the, uh, the millionaire's tax? Is that uh, something that's still in the, in the wings? It's still in the wings. It has to go through one more step at the legislature before it goes on the ballot in 2022, I think it is. Okay. My guess is it will go through the legislature and then get to the ballot. And that would provide between $1 billion to $2 billion more per year. And it would tax income over a million dollars a year. Income up to a million dollars would be taxed just as it always is. So if somebody was made $999,999, they'd be taxed just the way they always have been. Anything that they make over the million would then be subject to an additional tax, um, just the amount over a million. But there are a lot of people, um, we don't seem to know them, but there are a lot of people who uh, make that kind of money. And um, this would be a way to, to um, use that, those fundings to help with uh, education in particular, and then also some other capital, capital needs, transportation um, in addition to education. Sure. Speaking of um, ballot questions, John, uh, how do you how do you feel on the, the two that are coming up on November third? I think I'm about as confused as everybody else, <laughs> um, and and I've read them, um, and then you see the commercials, particularly for question one. It has to do with the the data uh, data from um, automobiles. Uh, you turn. I I don't know. I'm going to have to read that one again. We did um, pass, you know. Um, in the Commonwealth, there's a law that allows or um, requires a transmission of information for diagnostics on automobiles. That's on the books. This is a, it takes it to a, a different level. Um, and then on the ranked choice voting, I literally go back and forth every day. Uh, one day, you know, I, I read something on it and I say, oh, that makes sense. Maybe we should do ranked choice. And then the next day I'll read something else and say, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And the article that I just read hadn't covered that. Um, yeah, I, I think ideally, it would be good to, if you have four or five candidates in a race, to have a primary election, and, and if neither candidate gets, none of the candidates get 50%, to have a runoff of the top two, perhaps. Mm. That get, takes time, and it takes additional funding. Uh, and ranked choice voters, uh, supporters would tell you, this is a way to kind of accomplish that without having to have another election. But in the simplest terms, I, I agree with that. But then there's this, you know, when you get into a lot of math and allocation of votes, the further down you go, and... Um, so I just don't know. Yeah. I, I will um, continue to read on it and make up my mind as I go in. And I'm not trying to dodge a question. I, I legitimately just don't know how comfortable I am uh, in terms of an opinion on either one. Speaking of um, uh, voting, how do you think the state is handling the, the upcoming election in terms of all the different uh, voting methods that are open to people now? I, th- I think the state is doing well. and I think we're doing probably better than a lot of other places across the country. Um, we have, I know I can speak for my district, uh, the clerks in my district uh, are, are top notch. They just do an incredible job. They are professional, committed, um, nonpartisan. They're just committed to, to good, free, fair elections where every vote truly is counted. So we're very, very lucky. And I have the utmost confidence in their ability to run this election and run it well. The early voting by mail went well in the primary. And what people don't know is that uh, the election before that, Quincy was actually kind of a, a test site for mm-hmm. counting ballots um, in advance of election day, not revealing results, not even being aware of results, but processing them, I guess. Right. And as a result of that experience, they, they were ready and did a great job 
um, with the preliminary election back in September. So I think we've done a good job. And I was down in Braintree today um, at the Braintree Elder Services and a woman said, oh, I already voted. She goes, I know there's a lot of back and forth about uh, mail-in voting, she said, but I thought it was great. She said, this is today, she said, this is the first time I have been out. And she said, as you can see, she said, I'm keeping distance from everybody. I didn't want to go into a polling place or stand in a line. And she says, physically, I can't. She says, I just thought mail-in voting was, was, was the greatest thing. So between mail-in voting, early voting, which starts this Saturday, mm -hmm. and then regular election day voting, I think we've got all the bases covered. And um, I think we will do well here in Massachusetts. I fear that that's not going to be a, the case across the country. Um, you know, when you see people that there's one voting place, one location within a county of a few hundred thousand people, I mean, I just, I don't understand that. And in, in this day and age, in this country, I just don't understand it. When people are allowed to put out their own, basically ballot collection boxes, not official municipal, county or, or, or state boxes, it is mind boggling to me. And I never thought in my life, being a student of government since I was a kid, that I would ever see the day where I worried about the integrity of elections. But I, I matched that comment with my observation and belief that uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of people will do the right thing and that we will get uh, results that are reflective of the will of the voters. Anything else uh, should add today, uh, do you think, John? No, I think we covered a lot. I know I talk a lot, so I, I appreciate your patience. Not at all. It's, it's, a, it's a good conversation. It's timely and it, it's relevant to a lot of people. Yes. And I would just urge people to, to, to trust the election system here in Massachusetts. We've got great people working on it. Please vote. This is a very important election, regardless of whether you're Democrat, Republican, whatever the case may be, whoever your choice may be, just please vote. And I think it's important for our local community, for our Commonwealth, for our country. But I, I think it's just as important that we send the message to the entire world that while we've had some difficulties here in America, um, we are still a strong democracy and um, that you know, we stand for every vote counting. And um, I'm optimistic that when all is said and done, that, that will be shown. All right, folks uh, would like to reach out to you. What are some uh, good ways for them to do that? Uh, best way is, uh, well, there's two ways, uh, three ways. 617-722-1494 um, is the office number. And um, Doreen usually picks up the phone. And we're very fortunate, Doreen, uh, Abby Morgan and Andrea, uh, my staff, they have done, uh, our team has just done a great job during this pandemic and I, and I want to thank them and folks should feel comfortable calling with anything they need. So they can call or they can send an email to john.keenan at masenate.gov or if they just want to go, um, if they're looking for general updates on COVID or anything else, uh, senatejohnkeenan.com is, is the website and, and they can also contact us through that. So telephone, email and website. And then if you see me out and about, please let me know. It's just unfortunate they, that we're not out and about as much as we, we normally are. Sure. Well, appreciate your time, John. Great to talk to you. Great. Thank you, Joe. Be well. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you.